Welcome to Digital Hospitality. I am your host, Sean Walchef. This is a Cali BBQ Media production. Every single week we talk about our ongoing thesis and that is digital hospitality. Every business needs to be digital first and every business needs to be in the hospitality business. Every week we bring on somebody that is inspirational, somebody that is playing the game within the game. There's the digital game and there's the people that are actually executing this digital game and building businesses in real life, as well as sustainable communities, um, things that inspire us. So we had the founder, Will Ford of Launch Boom on this podcast, and he um, has an incredible company. It was one of our favorite episodes talking about Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Um, so Launch Boom helps companies scale on these platforms. And uh, I was speaking to Brad Enright, who's on Launch Boom's team. Uh, he's their product launch director. And he said, out of all the people that we've launched, which is a lot, hundreds of millions of dollars, products from all over the world, um, there's one person that you need to talk to, and that's Cleve Oynes, who is the founder of Man Kitchen. And um, Cleve is here for uh, his appearance on our show. Cleve, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Those guys are, are way too kind. Way too kind. Well, I guess when you uh, raise $2.25 million of crowdfunding um, on double platforms with uh, the products that you're launching, um, I'm, I'm guessing they've got great things to say about you. Yeah, well, it was a uh, mutual, mutually beneficial relationship, that's for sure. Those guys are fantastic on the marketing side. I couldn't have done it without them. So how did you find LaunchBoom? I attended two years ago, three years ago now, I attended the Launch Boom. They do a, a summit called the Crowdfunded Summit, where they basically have people that have, you know, walked the walk, come in and talk about how they were successful in crowdfunding. And that um, made a huge difference. So my first campaign, I raised like $50,000 for a chef knife. And, and that was awesome. You know, doubled my goal. And it was successful in my mind. And then we did the pepper cannon and blew that one out of the water. And the main difference was attending that summit and learning from the people at Launch Boom. And yeah, what a difference it makes having people that have done it before in your corner. Yeah, I think it's one of the things we love to talk about um, on this podcast. We say, stay curious, get involved and ask for help. I think one of uh, my biggest failings was asking for help and finding mentors, finding people that sat in the position that I wanted to be. And now I'm trying to do a better job of, of reaching out. But I, I want to bring you back to a point in your life. Um, we have a lot of people that are entrepreneurs, a lot of people that are business owners, small business owners. But we also have people that want to launch businesses. We have people that listen that are in sales or in marketing. But a lot of us are entrepreneurial. There is uh, some work that I did digging into your background before the show. And it said um, you were at a difficult point in your life where you got laid off and then you were looking for work. And when you're looking for work, somebody asked you, what would you do tomorrow if you could do anything? What would you do tomorrow if you could do anything? So if you're listening to this podcast, think about that. What would you do tomorrow if you could do anything? Do you remember that question? Oh, yeah. Yeah like it was yesterday, that was a, that was a moment of clarity for me because I was in an interview. Um, when I got laid off, it was kind of panic mode. You know, I have a family, I have a mortgage, I have bills that need to be paid. And I'd been, I'd been doing the same thing for almost 15 years, running e-commerce for a small jewelry company in Alaska. Um, and that was coming to an end. The owner passed away tragically it was a husband and wife team and the husband passed away and that led to serious decline in the business. And it was just, you know, like they're, they're, they're fantastic. And I wish them all, all success, but it was one of those things where, Hey, a change is coming and you've got to make it. And the first reaction was to panic basically and polish off a resume that hadn't been used in 15 years and sent out hundreds of applications, did a number of interviews. And that question was asked to me in the last interview that I had. Um, and I didn't want to go, I didn't want to get another job, you know? And my wife, I have to credit her with this. She said, you know what, Cleve, you've been wanting to start this business for years. Put your effort into that. She had more faith in me at that time than I had in myself. And I was just looking for a way to pay the bills. And she encouraged me to take that step. And it's difficult. You know, I, I, 
I probably could have started the business years and years before, but when you're comfortable, it is very difficult to make a change. And it took me being profoundly uncomfortable to take that risk. And the first year was a scratch. It was, <laughs> it was difficult. We built quite a bit of debt and not a lot of, and zero profit. So, um, but I wouldn't go back. What was the plan for the business when, you know, when you, when you were thinking about it at, at the job, you know, we have all had visions of what we think this business is, or we see a problem in the world that we think we can improve. What, what for you, what was it? For me, it was more just about, you know, using the things that I learned from years in e-commerce in an area that I actually had passion. So I've enjoyed cooking since I was a little kid. I've always enjoyed it. It's always something that I've done. Um, and aligning my professional interests with my personal interests was something that I wanted to do because I work in e-commerce in jewelry and I'm not a, I'm not a jewelry guy. I didn't have any <laughs> interest in, in jewelry. You don't have a bunch of jewelry on underneath that jacket? <laughs> no, no, chain, no chain. No chain. That's it. Okay. Fair enough. Wedding ring. That's, that's yeah, there you go. I got, I got that too. That's the extent of my jewelry. <laughs> there you go. So you can relate. Um, yeah. And it was just, aligning that personal interest with all the experience that I put in doing e-commerce. And um, yeah, it was, it was difficult to start out with my first product because I cooked forever on cast iron was uh, the best bachelor for cast iron. And that was my first product. And I launched that and it was three months before my first sale. Um, and that was, that was rough. You know, it, yeah. it, it takes some time to build stuff organically. What year was this? 2017 okay yeah 2017 end of 2017 so um yeah it's, it's been a while now now we've got a number of products um yeah all all of them are things that i've just experienced organically in the kitchen where i'm doing something and i go hey you know this could be this can be improved in this way um, and not for everybody, you know, it, the world is big enough now that if you find a problem that's for you and you sort out a way to solve it, and then you publish that your people will find you, you know, not everybody needs the products that we make, but for the people who, um, for the people, who, for those whom it solves a problem for it's, there's enough of them. We're, yeah. we're connected enough that there's, even if it's a niche product, they can find you now. Yeah, I think that's probably the most exciting realization that we've had just doing the podcast is understanding that no matter how small the problems are that we talk about, whether they're restaurant, whether they're barbecue, whether they're social media, no matter what it is, people can relate. You know, all villages are alike and we're a lot more connected than we ever have been. And technology has allowed us to hear something, listen to something and to take action. You know, it, it's much it's much easier to buy something that you you hear something about than it ever has been. Oh, for sure, yeah. And the and the thought that okay, well, I need to make something that appeals to everybody. You don't make something no. that solves a problem for you, um, and there'll be a the path to your door. So, where did the the brand come come from? Did you started with the cast iron? And when when did it become Man Kitchen? So it actually became Man Kitchen with that very first product. Um, man is old Norse for my, so man kitchen is my kitchen. Um, and it's related to going back to the, just the issues that I had. So the chef knife was, I have not giant hands, but larger hands. So I would always wrap my knuckles on the cutting board. So I wanted something that was a little thicker on the blade, um, a rounded spine. So it doesn't, you know, if you got a, your, your cook's callus there from where I'm using the pinch grip on your knife little things that I thought, okay, well, everybody's making a regular chef knife to appeal to everybody. Um, what about one that addresses the specific issues that I've had and see if it finds an audience? And the, the audience doesn't have to be huge to be economically viable. That's incredible. Um, so <laughs> I, I love I love hearing about your your origin story and um, about your mother and, and her oatmeal. Can you can you bring us back to, to mom's oatmeal? Yeah, yeah. So my 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 first introduction to cooking was I was not a fussy eater, still aren't. But oatmeal is something that I I ate a lot of when I was a kid, and it's just the the whole thing. Like it doesn't look good, it doesn't taste good, the texture isn't great. 
you got to add a lot of things to oatmeal to make it palatable. And my mom, you know, she had three boys, all of us were big eaters and she's a fantastic cook, but you don't always have the energy to make something different for uh, growing boys every morning. There's three of us. So oatmeal was frequently on the menu. And I got to the point where I said, you know, I think I was eight. And I go, mom, I'm not eating oatmeal anymore. She says, well, you can have whatever you like for breakfast. You just have to make it yourself. And uh, I thought, well, hey, I can do that. And she, she gave me your, she showed me your cast iron skillets and how to light the old propane stove. And she had a spice rack. And the first thing I made was eggs and ramen. And it was a, uh, the stuff I made was not always an improvement over oatmeal, but it got me introduced anyways. And that was, yeah. So that was my introduction to, to cooking and she was there to help throughout the whole thing. That's incredible. So you go from the cast iron skillet. Is the second product the pepper cannon? No, we did the, so we did the best bachelor for cast iron. And then we did a, a garlic press, which is something that I rarely use, but my wife loved and used all, of, all the time. Um, we've got three different spatulas now because um, the main spatula had sharper corners and it wasn't great for getting into the corners of smaller skillets. So we did a narrower spatula. We did a, uh, a big wide one specifically for smash burgers and then one for the grill. Uh, we've got oversized oven mitts for people that have oversized mitts. We do an apron that's, you know, made from canvas. So it's super durable and has pockets in the right places. And um, yeah, it's thick enough that you can actually use it as a quasi hot pad to handle your skillet handle. Most, most aprons are too thin. Um, and then the pepper cannon. And then now we've launched a line of man kitchen premium peppers from Campot. So we have white smoked red and black pepper from the Campot region of Cambodia that, you know, the people who use the pepper cannon start going through. For me, we went through about three times more pepper than we used to. As soon as we switched from a traditional <laughs> mill to the pepper cannon, I thought, hey, I need, we need to get into the pepper business because there you go. This is the big business, this pepper cannon. It is absolutely, you can go ahead and hear that. That's the power. That's the power of the pepper cannon. And uh, I very, very impressive. I can't okay. thank you enough for sending that over. Super excited to test it out. We used it for Thanksgiving. It's the first time that we tested it. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing that you solve a problem that every time that I'm grinding pepper, I don't realize that there's a problem until you point it out. And you do such a phenomenal job on your website, on your social, through your storytelling of what your product does. I mean, I think that's the, the big unlock with storytelling with products is that, you know, there's things that we use every single day and we don't realize that they could be better. And when they are better, you go, how can I ever go back? Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, I mean, like everyone else, I used ordinary pepper mills for 20 years and cranked away on that thing for a long time before it occurred to me, you know, this process could be improvable. I was making a tri-tip and I'd, I'd been cognizant of how long it was taking to get the amount of pepper I wanted on stuff. And so I started to count the cranks and I counted, I think it was over 60 cranks it was to do a, one tri-tip. And I thought, you know, this process has got to be improvable. And that began a journey of, it was two years from that moment to when the pepper cannon launched on Kickstarter. So it was a long, a long period, a lot of testing, a lot of prototypes, a lot of trial and error, but yeah, it, it does solve a problem. And when I, when I launched the pepper cannon, I wasn't sure if there was going to be a market for, it's expensive. You know, it's a $200 pepper mill. And most pepper mills are 20, 30, 40 bucks. You can get a nice one for 50 or $60. So it was a leap. And when I pressed go on the Kickstarter, I still didn't have a clue on whether it would be, whether enough people would have the same problem as I did and care enough about it to spend that amount on a, on a premium high speed pepper mill. And, um, yeah, we hit the goal in 11 minutes. 11 and minutes. What was the what was the campaign goal? The campaign goal was $10,000. Wow. And we hit that and that was enough to at that point I'd been working on it so long I was going to make the pepper cannon anyway. So that's <laughs> I actually placed, I, actually I was committed. Placed, I placed the order before cuz I was like, you know what? The, even if these sit in my garage for years, there's going to be people I know that are going to love this. So I'm going to get, and I placed as small as order as I possibly could. And that with the amount I already paid, if I raised $10,000, then I could, then I could pay for that first production run without going into a crazy amount of debt. So 
it was going to happen one way or the other, but it, yeah, when it blew through the goal and, and just accelerated for, yeah, that first 30 days on Kickstarter, it did a little over a million dollars on Kickstarter and then another 2 million on, on Indiegogo once the Kickstarter ended. Then we transitioned to uh, sales directly on mankitchen.com and we were finally able to get it in stock and it's still, still flying. That's incredible. That is, uh, I mean, it's, it, to, to make an impact on a company like LaunchBoom when they're, this is their business, literally they're launching, I don't know how many products daily, but you know, they're, they're raising significant capital, but to make a mark on them, on Will and on Brad, for them to be so impressed with how well you guys did in a very difficult category. Um, I mean, it's a testament to how great the Canon is. It's, I mean, it's a phenomenal product. It's sexy, it's sleek, it's different. Um, it is a great gifting item. You know, it is something that is a great gifting item. What, what, do you, what did you learn in those two years? Like, what, what would you do differently if you have a product, you know, maybe not the same as the Pepper Cannon, but something, something different? What yeah. would you tell yourself two years ago? Um, the main thing is solving a problem. You know, too often when we're in product launches, and this is true of myself, I'm solving just, most people in crowdfunding, their problem is I need money. <laughs> shocking. <laughs> shocking right? yeah that's the problem and <laughs> that is the, that makes that, sense <laughs> that message does not resonate with the consumer because no they're, they're the ones supplying the money so it's got to be an issue that if you don't have a if you can't say in 10 seconds what problem your product is solving it's going to be a it's going to be a tough sled now luckily with the pepper cannon it's demonstrably different than other pepper mills. It's very easy to say this is 10 times faster than other top rated mills. Um, and for a lot of people, that doesn't matter. A lot of people are completely satisfied with their existing mill and that's fine. Again, you, not everybody needs a pepper cannon. It's gonna be overkill for some, but for people who, who do cook and, have, and understand the difference between pre-ground and fresh ground pepper and what a huge difference that is and have spent days of their lives cranking mills or using other things like you know coffee grinders or you know those electric spice mills and stuff like that where yeah you can do a volume but you can't really control the grind range and you, it's not convenient at the table etc cetera, etc cetera. makes a big difference do you sell all of the your products also on amazon or is it just through your website the intention was to sell them all on amazon um but we had a, such a hard time getting the pepper cannon in stock. So we, we launched it on Kickstarter and, you know, within three days, we know, okay, I need to increase the original order. So ordered more. I think I ordered two more times before the end of the Kickstarter. So wow. there was more demand than we anticipated. Originally, I thought that I would have uh, units available in stock to begin shipping in May. We didn't have units available in stock to begin shipping until the end of November. So that was all wow. just trying to catch up with demand because then we moved it to Indiegogo um, and it was, and sales were outpacing how fast we could produce them. So um, yes, the plan was to send, put them on Amazon. Um, we still don't have enough units to, to put them on Amazon. So right now they're only available on, on mankitchen.com. Once we can finally catch up with demand, increase production enough to have it on those two platforms, then we will plan is still to put it on Amazon, but that'll be next year. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm always fascinated with people that are selling on Amazon. If they're selling successfully on Amazon, if they're choosing not to, um, if they're selling just direct to consumer, can you talk about the community that you've built? You know, it's one thing to promise, you know, the, the people on Kickstarter and Indiegogo, Hey, I'm going to solve your problem. I'm going to make you a sexy pepper can. And it's going to, you're going to want to tell everyone about it's another thing to actually deliver. Can you talk about, you know, kind of the first feedback you got? And Yeah, well, the first, so I, I come from, I come from an e-commerce background as opposed to a crowdfunding first background. Um, people that start out on crowdfunding, it's a, it's a completely different deal. You know, I wasn't, I'm not accustomed to, to long, putting anything up for sale until it's, until it's ready. Um, and that's why there was a two year run up before we started working on it to when it actually launched many crowdfunding places. Um, they're coming from a different background and they're kind of iterating and making changes as the campaign goes on and modifying it based on user feedback, which is a huge strength of, of crowdfunding, but it adds layers of complexity that down the line can make it very difficult and sometimes impossible to fulfill rewards. So a lot of crowdfunding backers are 
some of the best customers you'll get in your life. And I, I, the first person who I heard say that was Ido Sternberg at Jellup. They're the ones that do my, my marketing for the Kickstarter campaigns, uh, LaunchBoom for the Indiegogo campaigns, and then ongoing with LaunchBoom. And he's right, because these are consumers that are, they're early adopters. They're willing to take a risk on people that are unproven um, and products that are unproven. And they've been trained by Kickstarter and Indiegogo to wait. You know, they're used to laying out money in the beginning and then waiting three, four, five, six months, in many cases, three, four, five years to receive products and sometimes not receive them at all. Um, so my background, again, was a little different. I didn't launch it until I felt it was ready. So the early feedback came from I sent some products to people in the space that I admired and had been following for years that I was like, you know, even if these people give, you know, zero plugs for the product, I'm still curious about what they think about it, whether they think it'll be useful. Um, so I sent, I sent one to J. Kenji Lopez Alt, who's someone who I've followed for a long time and really admire. Um, Babish of Binging with Babish is somebody who I really enjoy. Um, and both of them got back to me relatively quickly with very encouraging feedback. So that was the, that was the first feedback. And uh, were these warm leads, like you, you knew them, like you told them you were going to send it, or you just said straight up, figured out their address and said, Hey, <laughs> yeah, I admire you. This is my love letter. This is my gift. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you're willing to give me feedback, that would be phenomenal. If not do it, do what you will. Yeah. So I, I got, uh, 40 prototypes of the pepper cannon before any release. I ordered 40 with the idea of distributing those to people that I admired, knew or didn't know. Um, so there were cooks that I knew that I gave them to and got feedback from, but I didn't know either of those guys before I sent them out. I just found a found a place to send them. You know, J. Kenji Lopez all at that time at a restaurant, Worst Hall in California. So I just I wrote him a note, said, you know, the restaurant attention Kenji, and, and hoped it got to him. And yeah, lucky it did. Lucky he was generous enough to open the box and try it out and give me some feedback. And that was very, very encouraging. That's super cool. I, I love the fact that you're willing to do that. That's got to be a terrifying thing when you've been working on something for that long. And then you, you know, you have mentors or people that, you know, you look up to and you're impressed with the work that they do and you go would you be willing to review this for me <laughs> yeah yeah well and again so there was 40 of them that i sent out and i heard back from 11 or 12 so that's a good rate that's a good was, rate of return it was, it was pretty good yeah yeah, yeah. and if the, i mean 25 if, over 25 percent. that's fantastic yeah yeah i was i was i was it was enough to be encouraged and to not and to not hang it up anyways can you talk about your the, the social media stuff that you do? I love the fact that you guys are willing to publish the outtakes of the content that you're creating. Um, I think that's a big miss for so many companies, so many brands that I see on social media is that they're unwilling to show the things that go wrong. Um, it makes you human. It makes you likable. It makes you uh, part. It makes you part of the story. It makes you feel like you're you're behind that fourth wall. Um, what, what was the decision to do that? And um, do you guys have a strategy or is it just kind of, uh, we're going to put ourselves out there as authentic as possible? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that was the strategy. If you, try and, if you try and present yourself in a way that isn't authentic to who you are, you're going to have to be playing catch up all the time with people who are expecting something different than what they should from you. Uh, and that was just, you know, I mean, I'm sitting in the room that I recorded that Kickstarter video and these are the lights I got on Amazon. It was a very low budget deal. I recorded it myself, wrote the script myself, and then had a huge amount of help from a guy named Terry Nelson, who's at entertainment.ca. He's somebody that I knew from 20 years ago and he owns a video production company in Canada. And my first Kickstarter video, you can go and watch it and it's, it's terrible. <laughs> we'll put a link in the show notes for sure Stover, yeah. be sure to put a link in the, we, we can, love terrible videos you can tell immediately <laughs> the difference between terrible videos encourage other people to go and start for sure you have to start somewhere and everyone's everyone's first of anything is probably terrible yeah there's this myth that your first step has to be in the absolute right direction but it doesn't it just has to be a step in some direction and you're going to get clarity on exactly where that should be as you move. So the first video was horrible. The second one, um, I, I enlisted his help and he took 
oh gosh, hours of just garbage footage that I recorded for him. And, you know, I am not a videographer or a script writer or any of that. So I gave him just <laughs> piles and piles of material that he was generous enough to sift through and do all the editing and turn it into a cohesive story and adds, you know, the sound effects and the music and all that stuff. So huge credit to them for helping out with the video. The video is the most important part of the media for uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, because that's what most- What's the length watch. of the video the, for those platforms? Uh, it's over four minutes and most people shoot- It for has to be over four minutes or no, it needs to it be under? It can be as short as you want it or as long as you want it. Got it. Um, most videos I think are under a minute and a half. Uh, but the main thing is for it to be engaging. You know, if you yeah. can get someone's attention in the first five seconds and then hold it for the amount of length of time it takes to communicate the what problem you're solving, you've got a you've got a decent shot. So you want an example of how not to do it, watch my first video. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I hit just about every note wrong. Oh, that's fantastic. What uh what what have you you do you still live in Alaska? No, no. Born and raised in Alaska. My wife is from Hawaii. So when we first got married 20 years ago, we lived in Seattle for a little while because neither of us wanted to live in our hometowns. And then we did, <laughs> so we did a couple of years in, uh, in Seattle. And then we had our first child and visited Alaska and had a taste of free babysitting from my parents. And that was <laughs> enough to get us to move back to uh, Alaska. We were there seven years and then we did Hawaii for four in Seattle. And now we're, we're sorting out a way to hopefully be able to split time between, between Hawaii and Seattle. That's awesome. So now, so now the man kitchen, this is a full-time business. Do you have other employees? Is it you and your wife? No, it's uh, you're, you're looking at the man kitchen team and then it's, uh, <laughs> that is beautiful. That is lean and mean. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it could be leaner for sure. <laughs> what? Uh, so, what are you? What are you working on? Tell tell me more about the uh, the actual pepper um, that you guys are creating. I, so, this is another thing I saw on social that I loved is that you're willing to test and ask questions. So, you you have a couple different um, pepper flavors, right? Yeah. So, and all of them, it all comes from the same plant, Piper nigrum. Uh, it's a vine. Pepper is actually a fruit. It's the seed. So the black pepper is what people are used to. That's when the, it's harvested while it's still green and then dried. Red pepper, same fruit. It's just allowed to fully ripen before it's dried. White pepper is the same fruit again, uh, soaked to remove the, the fruit from the seed. And then it's just the seed. And then the smoked pepper is black pepper that's, um, that, that's smoked. And all four of those are very, very, they have a very different flavor profile, very different aroma. Most people are used to whatever comes out of the shaker at the restaurant, which is, yes. you know, has the aroma of sawdust and has probably been there for years minimum. So people are, have very low expectations and think that they know, well, this is what pepper tastes like because it all tastes the same. That's not the case. There's a huge difference between fresh ground and pre-ground, huge difference between uh, peppers from different locations. You can get different heat, different flavor, different aroma. So I wanna introduce people to what a pepper experience can, can be as opposed to what they're used to. And uh, premium peppers are, are the way to get there. So I have an ignorant question. Um, how, what about paprika? Because that's a spice that I use more than many other spices. Sure, yeah. So paprika is, is, a, is a chili. Mm -hmm. uh, not a seed, so different plant. Uh, all, all chilies originally came from South America, but made their way. So like Indian food, I love Indian food, but all of their heat came from like pepper and ginger until peppers came back from the new world. Um, kind of like tomatoes in Italy, um, that stuff came from the new world. So paprika, uh, you could, you could get the peppers and grind fresh paprika in the pepper can. And that would be, that would be pretty cool. It sounds like something that would be really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I've ground, I've ground fennel through it, coriander through it, dried rosemary, um, anything that's small enough to gravity feed. You know, don't grind rocks, but most spices and things that you can eat, you can grind with pepper can as long as they're sufficiently dry. If there's a lot of moisture, you know, they can get gummy and not gravity feed properly, or things that are giant like nutmeg um, won't feed, but 
Hey, you can grind a lot of things through the pepper can, which is- So what, what's the process now? So now you have four flavors that people can add to this pepper cannon that I have right here that I'm showing. If you guys are watching on YouTube, if you're not, um, you can check it out on YouTube, but the pepper cannon, absolutely incredible. But on this post, you're talking about sleeves. The, the problem is, right, once you start to change the flavor profile in the pepper cannon, how do you solve the uh, knowing what, what's actually in it? Yeah, yeah. So we're still sorting that out. You can see on Instagram the the, the solution that I have is these horribly ugly silicone sleeves. <laughs> I'm definitely not going to bring to market. They work, um, but they take an item that looks like you know a premium two hundred dollar pepper mill and make it look like a you know forty dollar rubber yeah. plastic pepper mill. So that won't be the option. I'm leaning towards a colored button or or a smaller or a narrower sleeve that will just you know give a hint of color. So people can differentiate, but um, for most people, you're not going to need four different varieties of pepper at the same time. It's more try them all, figure out which one you like. Um, hey, it would be great if everybody needed, you know, pepper from Vietnam and Cambodia and Indonesia and telecherry pepper and Vietnamese pepper and, and a pepper cannon for each one. But um, <laughs> yeah, if you just want black pepper, get a premium one, find the one you like and um, try a few so you can taste the difference. Can you give somebody that's listening? I mean, we talk to restaurant owners and small business owners all the time. Part of the reason why we love this podcast is we teach, you know, somebody that's a brick and mortar business to understand how important it is that they start to become an e-commerce company to start to think of how can I sell this directly to the consumer online? Can you think of, can you talk about the principles of e-commerce what are the most important things that somebody does once they actually go go live if you're speaking to a small business owner that um, traditionally does business in real life right in front of somebody? Yeah, yeah. Um, the main thing is going back to how, how connected we can all be. Um, make a product that solves that, that solves that problem for you and taking it online enables you to even if you only touch you know a fraction of one percent of the marketplace in the united states you can have a successful business with a very with a, with a niche product um and that kind of gives you a little bit of courage in knowing that hey i don't have to make something that's okay for everybody i can make something that's okay for somebody if it works for me, it's going to work for more. And the internet is what enables us to do that. We can connect to that, that broader audience. And as far as e-commerce, um, kitchen is completely different space, you know, than, than I started with in, in jewelry. Very, very different, very, very different consumer. Um, it works much better to be in a space where you have some some passion for it. Um, and I think that comes through if you're authentic in the content you create and your communication, it's just, you know, it's people talking with people as opposed to people talking with a company or some, um, some strange entity that they don't know. It's, it's, it's more personal and you can be more personal on the internet than you can be in that very limited um, interaction that you might have face to face with face to face with someone over the counter because you can create authentic content and really build out and dig down and those people can experience that without it having to be a one on one interaction. I love that. Yeah, it's some of the things we talk about is how important you know when you're creating social media content when you're telling your story online. Most people, what they do as a business is that we create stories for the consumer. So it's you go on someone's Instagram feed, like a barbecue restaurant, and they're making pictures of ribs, pictures of brisket. This is, you know, what you expect to see on social media. The real unlock is once you understand that you're already telling those stories, why not start telling the stories of your vendor partners so I can start making B2B content where I'm actually documenting, telling stories of why we use Toast, which is our primary technology partner, why we use US Foods to help source our products, all the different things that happen in our restaurant. But the even bigger unlock is that it's human to human. Yeah. So it's not the logo. It's not the brand Cali Barbecue. It's Sean, who's a dad, who's a husband, 
And yes, I live a life. And yes, I care about the chargers. Like the more that I start to share my personal life, which is my business life, back to what, what gets you out of bed in the morning, like what do you want to do today? You want to do something that life is way too short. It's way too short to be doing shit that we don't want to do. I mean, one of my closest friends is Sam the Cooking Guy. He's appeared on this podcast multiple times. He has 3 million followers on YouTube. He has cookbooks, Emmys, but he was literally sitting in the same position you are at one point when he launched his career, where he was literally at a biotech firm sitting in the parking lot going, I don't fucking want to do this. Yeah. I can't do this. Yeah. This isn't what, this wasn't what life, life was meant to be for me. Yeah. And how many people have felt that in the last two years where they're like a moment of clarity? Why am I here? You know, what am I, what am I doing? I was selling jewelry for 15 years, nothing against jewelry, but not me. Right. Yeah. A lot of people are trying to sort out and taking that first step. I'm, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy because it isn't. I mean, I had to be intensely, intensely uncomfortable to take that to take that risk but what's the alternative you could you could you could slave for 30 years in a cubicle and they're gonna they're gonna remember you for three days after you leave yeah that's 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 the absolute truth and i, I appreciate you sharing your uncomfortable journey um i mean the the success success that you guys have had and what you're continuing to build and now you're building with purpose with passion doing the things that you love to do solving your problem which you've already discovered the unlock is the problem of so many others and through that gift through the internet through e-commerce you're allowed to reach so many people and then continue to work on cool shit like yeah. ultimately isn't that what we all want to do because that's what i want to do yeah, I don't want to wake up and go, fuck, I don't want to go to work. Like, no, we have a barbecue media company. I'm fired up every single day that I get up because I get to go and do things that I love to do. I mean, most yeah. barbecue restaurant owners aren't going to spend time talking about e-commerce e and pepper cannons. But for me and the people that listen to this podcast, they get it. They understand that this whole thing is way bigger than any of us can even imagine. Oh. And we're still so early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And And on the other side of it, I mean, the marketplace in the world needs your unique voice. Like you've probably sorted something out on your own and, and every listener to your podcast is probably thinking about something like, you know what, this is what I want to do. Um, the world needs to hear that stuff, like solve a problem. It doesn't need to be a problem that everybody has one that you've done for yourself. I want to hear about it. Um, yeah. The marketplace needs to hear about it. You can actually make a difference in a small way or a large way just by using that voice that you've got, you know? I love it. Uh, at Man Kitchen, Cleve, uh, what's the best place for people to get interact with you? Where are you guys most active on social? Instagram? Most active on social, probably Instagram, uh, at Man Kitchen, M A N N Kitchen. And then, yeah, for products, Man Kitchen mankitchen.com. Awesome. Yeah. Hopefully uh, you guys listen to this podcast, get your own pepper cannon and uh, tag me and in, in your video, your pepper cannon video, um, because it's an absolute incredible product. Um, we're super grateful to have you on the show. Um, anybody that listens, you know, you guys can reach out to me at Sean P. Walchef on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn. Every Friday we do a 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time Clubhouse call, um, Cleve. Hopefully when your podcast episode drops, we can get you on a Friday Clubhouse call where we have uh, other people in the industry, hospitality industry, digital marketing, sales. Um, we just get together and have a powwow and talk about your episode and talk about Launch Boom and Kickstarter and e-commerce and any cool things that you have going on. So uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, I'm super grateful. If you ever make it to San Diego, please uh, hit me up. Come check out the uh, the barbecue restaurant. And, uh, we appreciate you. Awesome. We'll do. Thanks for having me. Got it. Thank you.